I started with the IPA in July 2003, both sides of politics and the CSIRO were claiming that salt levels were rising in the Murray River. Now, I didn't have any reason to dispute the claim, but I wanted to see the data. I wanted to understand the magnitude of the problem, the seasonality of it, the general nature of it. I wanted to see the data. Eventually, I received daily readings, after much effort, back to 1938 from the Murray-Darling Basin Commission for the key site of Morgan, which is just upstream from the offshoots of Adelaide's water supply. When I plotted these daily uh, readings as yearly averages, I could see, this is what the graph looked like, um, goes to the, uh, the middle of 2003. When I plotted the daily readings as yearly averages, I could see that salt levels were rising in the 60s and 70s. But from the early 80s, levels started to drop. In fact, they've halved since 1982. Over the last two years, salt levels have fallen even further and are now historical lows. This is due in part to the construction of salt interception schemes as well as improved uh, land management practices. This year, on federal budget night, Federal Treasurer Peter Costello announced another $500 million for the Murray River. Incredibly, the Treasurer falsely suggested, and you're hearing it yet again, that salt levels are rising, still rising, in the Murray River, and that this money is needed, the centrepiece of the government's commitment to saving the Australian environment this financial year, to, 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 to reduce salt levels. Leaders within the environment movement and the farm lobby know that it is wrong to claim salt levels are still rising in the Murray River. And they know there are higher environmental priorities for the 500 million. But they turn their head the other way because so many vested interests seem to want to keep believing there is some sort of environmental crisis in rural Australia. And the Murray River has for too long been the icon issue for these doomsayers. In August this year, I read at ABC Online on the web how water levels in the Murray River are the lowest <coughs> since records began more than 100 years ago. But the article was confusing low water inflows with low water levels. The journalist apparently unaware that the Murray River actually ran dry in 1914 and the records go back before then. The river at Riversdale in 1914. During this drought, where we have people claiming and it's not being, not being challenged by environmentalists or the farm lobby, but we have, have the ABC saying that levels are at all-time low, South Australian irrigators are receiving a full 80% of their water entitlement, thanks to the dams and weirs upstream in New South Wales and Victoria. And the river is full of water all the way to South Australia. Same site. <laughs> the second example that I wanted to make mention of was the Pilliga Gnu forests of northwest New South Wales. In May last year, the New South Wales government legislated to ban logging over a further 350,000 hectares in the Pilliga Gnu forest of northwest New South Wales in response to environmental campaigning. The New South Wales government claimed that it was important, necessary, for protecting these iconic forests. Yet the forests are only about 150 years old, a bit less. Early explorers described this landscape, where there's now forest, as open grassland or open box woodland. Following the explorers came settlers and sheep, and then terrible drought, and then terrible floods. And a native cypress grew up after the floods and with no fire and limited grazing, thickets developed. And a timber community started to thin, control burn and generally tend the young forests. Much of Australia, including the land west of the Great Dividing Range in New South Wales and Queensland, was once open grassland, actively managed by Aboriginal people through the use of fire. Remove fire as a, as a management tool, introduce sheep, some overgrazing, and grassland areas will be lost to various species of woody weeds. In some situations, for example, the Pilliga Gnu, the woody weeds can be effectively managed and grown into biologically diverse and productive forests. But rather than considering the evidence, including the history of the forest, the New South Wales government blindly responded to the environmental campaigning. Imagine how different the outcome might have been 
if there had been an alternative strong environmental lobby explaining the history of the forest and explaining the plethora of studies that show managed state forests can be as biologically diverse as unmanaged national park. We might still have a viable timber community as well as happy barking owls and koalas in the Pelican Canoe. In short, there's no truth, however inconvenient, that should not be exposed to the blowtorch of healthy scepticism. There should be no claim, however morally appealing, that we are not prepared to test against the available evidence.